So uh, I guess the new app, that's the big word on the street. Tell me, just start telling me about it because I know very little other than what Shane told me on the phone the other day. He was like, hey, well, do you want to hear about it? And I was like, I mean, yes, but kind of <laughs> no because I want to ask about, about it when we're doing the podcast. So. Yeah, so there's there's a lot here to unpack. I mean, there's there's so many things going on with this. Um, for those that don't know, I'm a tracker. I track deer of my my coon hound. And one of the big issues we have during tracking season is, you know, as it gets closer to the rut, the volume of calls coming in and and navigating through all those tracking requests mm-hmm. and finding out who's who's available, other trackers that are available trying to maximize efficiency, like getting one that's closer to them, you know, or the, you know, one of the goals is also to get a a team that's qualified to track. You, you don't want your best teams on them if they're available. We want to get the highest recovery rate as possible mm-hmm. for, for the folks in Minnesota. I'm part of the Minnesota Tracking Dogs group. And it's very difficult. I mean, I spend time when I'm, when I'm not out tracking. We have a system set up on our website where tracking requests come in. And uh, we kind of use email and and Facebook group uh, Mm -hmm. posts, private group posts to say, hey, there's a track here. Who's available? There's a track. And it's just very hectic trying to navigate through all that and and make it efficient. So I've been I've had this thought in my head for several years now that there's got to be a better way. Maybe if there was a mobile app and you could communicate that way. And I started to to go down the road of development. At one point, we talked to a developer and had them, you know, give us some prices and and whatever, play around with that. But the price ballooned far beyond what we could afford. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, I'm talking about, about God, uh, Greg Goffrey. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of shelved the idea. And so I said, well, the next best thing is to do a website. So we, in Minnesota Tracking Dogs, created a submission request form, tracking request form. Folks would go in there, fill it out, hit submit email goes out to all the admins then we send out to the rest of the trackers in the network the hunters loved it number one they didn't have to post publicly on social media yep um especially if they were hunting in an area and they didn't want someone to know where they're targeting a big buck or mm-hmm. they're embarrassed because some people will kind of shame people looking for a dog yeah or you're trying to get a hold of tracker at eleven thirty at night 12 o'clock at night you don't want to text and call them so you'll wait till tomorrow morning well one hunter in particular i ended up tracking for I got a request at like 11 o'clock at night. I was just got in bed and I, and I saw it wasn't far away. And I said, oh, so I texted him back. I said, uh, you were free to, for a phone call? Sure. I called him up, made arrangements the next morning, went out there and found his deer. Mm-hmm. He said, man, I loved it. It took a lot of stress off of me. I went to bed that night knowing I had a tracker come next morning. I didn't have to call a bunch of trackers to see who was available. And so <clears throat> talking to Greg, I said, Greg, we got to get this app idea going. I mean, this this right here proves it's a valid reason to have it. Mm-hmm. And so talked to uh, um, Garrett over here and Ryan Carpenter. Uh, Ryan's done a lot of my st- statistics mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yep. navigating through yep. all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which and if you guys haven't listened to the podcast that we did, what, maybe a year two ago? Year, two years ago? Two years? Year, year almost ago. exactly a year yeah. ago, I think. Okay. Yeah, which we talked. Mm-hmm about statistics and you know broadheads and and pass throughs and you know mm-hmm. odds of recovery and all that stuff so that's this is ryan carpenter he was on the uh audio version i don't mm-hmm. know if this will be on video or audio mm-hmm. or both this will be on both okay so um if you're listening to it go watch it and you'll see what he looks like but <laughs> if you care for that <laughs> and then uh, garrett prawl beside me diy sportsman on the other end of the couch there anyway <clears throat> I was looking for people to go in with mm-hmm. friends, people I could trust, and because it's going to be a lot of money involved building an app, it's not a cheap, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, mm-hmm. adventure there. But anyway, we we found a, a developer and we started building this app. And from the onset, it was keep the tracker in mind, you know, what and the hunter also make mm-hmm. it most efficient for them two to get in touch with with each other, and and don't be so concerned about making a a profit that's what a lot of mm-hmm. people want to do they just like how can i make money right i was trying to solve a problem here that yeah. we needed as mm-hmm. a tracker i I wanted it solved because mm-hmm. it was a nightmare every rut especially in minnesota when gun season opens right in the middle of the rut and a quarter million hunters or however many hunters hit the woods at the same time mm-hmm. you're talking 50 to 100 tracking calls a day comes yeah, in through our geez. network and it's crazy 
And a lot of those are misses. And the hunter shoots at them with the rifle and doesn't even have any blood. They just want to make sure mm -hmm. I didn't miss. I mean, that I actually missed. But anyway, so uh, enough about that. That's that's how the app came to be, um, how it got to this point. And so we started working on it. And we have, it's not a totally finished uh, version. I mean, it's a workable version. It's, it's finished as far as what it can do. Mm -hmm. We're going to add features. But basically, um, you go into the app, you sign up as a hunter or a tracker. Mm -hmm. Trackers, they'll be vetted. So when you sign up, you don't get to use the app until we approve you on the admin side. You know, your your recoveries, we'll talk to other people. We'll make sure that you're, you're a legit tracker mm -hmm. and, and, and you'll get to be on the app. As a hunter, you can log in, create an account. Um, you can submit a request. It doesn't cost you anything. You can actually create a toolbox. Um, Garrett has the hunter account on his phone. I have it, the tracker account open on my phone. But um, if you want to scroll through your profile there. Um, yeah, so basically on the toolbox, you, know, you can add items and you can type in whatever weapon that you would want, you know, rifle, or if you got one bow set up or you got another bow set up, you can fill that out ahead of time, mm -hmm. which will save you time when you actually need to use the app if you've got all that pre-plugged in. Because once you go to then make a request, it becomes uh, pretty straightforward and easy in that you can ultimately just say, I need to make a request. Here were the stats about the hunt. I was this high up. I was using you know this broad header. Just select mm -hmm. that weapon from your toolbox. Mm -hmm. Here's my location. You can send out that request. And then that request goes out to basically all the trackers who have that within their search area. And then maybe you can talk about that side a little bit yeah so as when you as a hunter if you set up your account you don't have to fill out that weapon you mm -hmm. can but we also don't want to slow hunters down at getting a tracking request in so when you get to that point in the request you can just say i shot it with a bow yep you, mm -hmm. but if if you want to get a thorough picture to the tracker um like what kind of bow i mean compound crossbow what kind of broadhead that's mm -hmm. really important did you get a pass through or not i mean a lot of that st all the details you can give or the more you can give them the, the mm -hmm. better and the um, speed of it, too, in comparison to, like, a sheet or oh, yeah. sending an email and, right. and having to log in. I mean, it's all just right well, there. Well, if you have very weak, weak service out there and you're trying to to get on a tracking group and scroll through their list oh, of yeah. trackers, and then you call each one, there's no answer, or they're not available, you go to the next one. So you got to do that. With this here, you hit Submit. And it instantly goes out to all the trackers in the area. Mm -hmm. Push notification comes yeah. to my phone. So when I'm setting up my profile here, you'd see that, you know, these are fake ratings up here. But um, I'm UBT for verified. That means um, um, I'm a UBT member with a certification there, UBT1. I passed the test. It proves that my dog's capable of finding deer. I have six years' experience. I track on lead only. There's off-lead tracking. Some people do both, depending mm -hmm. on the situation of the near highway, and they want to keep the dog on lead to keep them from getting run over, hopefully. Uh, then your services, like here you can select what type of animals you track. Oh, cool. I have all seven of the ones in the app right now currently selected for testing, but I would only put deer. I only track deer for people, so it would say one service. And then my fee at the bottom. This is optional. Trackers don't have to put anything there. Mm -hmm. But you know, I track for free, and I accept tips. Some may say $100 come track, $100 if I recover, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, or you can just leave it. But blind. at least it's up front. You know yeah. what you're dealing with instead of having to negotiate. With the app either. Yeah, there's no so. cost involved with, like, money exchanging hands yeah. through the app. If you want to tip your tracker, that's between you and him. Yep. If you want to pay your tracker, that's between you and him. No no third we're, party. We're just connecting. Yeah, money here. We just yeah. we want to connect the hunters and trackers, and we don't want to mess things up like that. Yeah. You're just trying to essentially help everybody yeah right like it's yep. efficient for you as a tracker but it's also making it easier yeah, for us as hunters where we don't have to go through the stress of jumping on facebook or making yeah. a bunch of calls or looking it up online well, you yeah. know service. you're out of state and it's who do you call yeah. you don't even know where to start yeah, yeah so um, and one of the things here as a tracker um you can go to this little thing's going to be in my way up here uh screen grab um so here's um my active jobs, you know, I, this is jobs that I have to track or whatever. This one's in work. This one here's a hunter review that I've offered to take his track. Again, these are test ones. That's why you'll see duplicate names. And um, I'm waiting for him to either decide whether he wants me as a tracker or not. And then my history over here of all the tracks I've covered, 
you know, test tracks, obviously. And those will will have a stat with them as well? Right now, this is the way it's going to be when you see it. Okay. Because this is the launch, ver- launch version. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to add a search history where you can search through different tracks. Uh, there will be other info that comes with it. Mm-hmm. It's part of the analytics. Mm-hmm. But just just rest assured that whatever you do with a track, any information, it's stored in the background. Mm-hmm. And none of the personal stuff is saved, but like the information about you know, what – it was you tracked how far it went uh, mm-hmm. what it was shot with all the the important stuff as far as from a hunting standpoint mm-hmm. and we're collecting that to give not only trackers their personal data tracking data to display in their analytics page but we're going to create a, a national thing where you can go through and look at like ten thousand deer shot across the country this fall uh, this many were hit with this and we can get into all that later mm-hmm. that's a, a lot of details there but people are going to really love that aspect and that's mm-hmm. coming later in the app probably during deer season at some mm-hmm. point as we build it but as a tracker here i can select my service region let me clear this email real quick and um you can have up to a 300 mile range around you and like we're down here in iowa doing it right now you can blur this out if you like but mm-hmm. um, my typical range is about 70 miles um, but you could increase that and then mm-hmm. you can update that as you travel around you can update it and say hey oh, let's see if there's anything near me mm-hmm. so once you save that service region any tracking request that pops up in that area sends you a push notification as long mm-hmm. as it matches the animal you track or the animals mm-hmm. and so you get a little chime of vi- your phone vibrates and it says tr- tracker uh, hunter needs a tracker in this area mm-hmm. for whatever the other thing is you can go to the request and it shows a list of all the requests. Total of three requests. Two of them are deer. One's uh, an elk. Mm-hmm. Garrett shot an elk. <laughs> um, and then so then another feature. This is really nice, especially for me. Like I've I've been in Minnesota long enough, but not long enough to l- to know learn every single town. Mm-hmm. Plenty of times, you know, the tracking requests available in this little town, and I'm like, yeah, I wonder where that's at. That's got to be close. Look it up, and it's four hours away. Oh mm-hmm. nope. And then another one pops up. Well, that sounds far away. Look it up, and it's 20 minutes away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and so there's a tracker. You can click on the track and request map. It's kind of hidden. There we go. Um, there was a screen record option blocking it. And at a click, quick glance, I can see my location and, and proximity to these tracks. Mm-hmm. Red means the track's available. Green means it's covered. Another tracker's taking it. Um, there will be a gray pin if the hunter pauses the track and he may be getting permission to track on a neighbor's property a deer went over there and so he decides to pause it but it'll have the reason like hunter paused it because he's trying to get permission to track mm. the reason for that is to keep us keep it on our radar yep. i'm in the area track and i see there's a pause track let me go ahead and track this take this track mm-hmm. i'll be done in an hour or two i'll come back and check i could call the hunter and say hey i'm in the area i'm getting ready to leave you still you know and so it helps with that communication and yeah. There's been plenty of instances where I've been on an area in an area tracking, you know, two hours from home. I'm calling around. Hey, is any, does anyone know if there's any other tracks tracks available in this area? I'm calling mm-hmm. other trackers. They're off track and they're they're not able to answer my call. You know, they're doing other stuff. I drive home. I'm almost home. Tracking request pops up. You know, hey Shane, you still up in so and so? I'm like, no, I left there an hour and a half ago. Oh, this guy's been looking for a tracker for the last hour and just realized you were up there i did, didn't realize that i was off track myself so this right here helps to eliminate yeah that uh, which ultimately issue. too from the hunter standpoint is going to relieve stress and mm-hmm. going to ensure that their calls and their requests are getting reached mm-hmm. constantly instead mm-hmm. of on the other hand while you're on a track you're probably not just sitting there thinking well let me respond to every single message or give this guy a call back right. if you're on a different track yeah but when, you're still gonna get the notification the, when we're yeah, when we're on help tracks. help coordinate it all, right? Like in the times that, mm-hmm. let's say you three are all trackers, you're on a track, you're on a track, but Garrett's not on a track, and I need one. I'm gonna be able to connect with him in that moment if and we're all in and, the same area, and or or he's farther away, and you take him anyway. Now he's gonna be driving here, and I'm gonna be going back by him, and mm-hmm. I could have taken it had right. I not. But a tracker, when they're on a track, they're usually dedicated to that track. Mm-hmm. My phone's ringing. I usually silence it. Mm-hmm. You know, I bring it out to look at my map, text right. notification. I just swipe it out of the way. 
I get back to the truck, and most a lot of trackers do. I shouldn't say most, but I know myself and a few others do it. You know, get done tracking. You mind if I park it into your driveway for a little bit and catch up on messages? Yeah, yeah go ahead. You know, so I get down there, and I'm going through 50 text messages, 10 missed calls. Um, a lot of the text messages are, hey, I heard you have a tracking dog. Um, I, I may need one and blah, blah, blah. And there's there's no location, no, no other information. Yeah, there's no follow-up to yeah, even and, go off. Yeah, right. and, and so who do you call out of those 50 mis- messages? Yeah. Where do you start? You don't know the location. You don't know the details. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not going through every one of these calls, and then this one's four hours, and you need to call so-and-so. You know, it's just a – like I said, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it. Yeah, it's, it's – it, at the beginning of the season, in September, it's pretty oh, smooth yeah, rolling. It's, a, it's probably more like one a day or, but or one every couple of days or something. November 7th, you yeah. know, in that, era, that time frame, it's uh, pretty hectic. But uh, this will hopefully uh, make things go a lot easier. And, and the feedback we got from the, the Minnesota Tracking Dogs website and that – submission uh tracking request uh, form um it made things run a lot smoother we i think we doubled our recoveries this year over, over last year we handled a lot more tracking requests a lot more efficiently i mean the stats proved that we were more efficient overall as a group mm-hmm. and this is just going to make it even that more efficient so this can be done with trackers and hunters countrywide then yeah when it launches mm-hmm. now Android will be should be available when this is live. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a couple of days from now going live. Uh, we had the working versions on the phone, obviously. Yeah. iOS is we built Android first. iOS is being built to match. So instead of building two at the same time, mm-hmm. they just built one. We worked the bugs out, and now they just code iOS. That'll be ready at the end of August, first part of September. Yep. yep. Before deer season starts in most places. Right. Um, you know, down in South Carolina, deer season will be in, and Kentucky and things like that. And bear season will be in in some states. But mm-hmm. you know, they'll miss a few days. And they can do it the old-fashioned way. It's not like the tracks are really right. hot and heavy. Right. Um, but, I mean, there's – so those two will be available by the time deer season starts. Uh, both versions will be available for download on Google Play and the App Store. And uh, on our website will be links to take you there. Yeah, that's pretty slick. I mean, I have only – used a tracker one time and it was you and i was able to just call you direct and yep. have a conversation right. it's a friend it's a totally different deal right but it's like if you don't have that experience it just yeah makes the whole process and that brings up a good point i want to make about it because i was so relieved when that deer showed up still like well showed up dead from another hunter mm-hmm. shooting it but when we leave there like i left there and i said I think it might have been a non-lethal shot. I can't say for sure, but I hope so. And, I, and my dog, well, as far as we tracked it, mm-hmm. and all the clues were telling me this deer wasn't dead right away mm-hmm. or not dead that day. And he ended up, we ended up you know, finding out that mm-hmm. it was dead later on. 14 days later, somebody shot it with a rifle yep. in exactly the spot where you had had tracked yep. to, yep. which is really cool and also – uh, that was about the area I said, I smell a ruddy buck. Yeah, right. it, was exa- it, was, it was exactly I was like, there. this smells like a ruddy buck's been laying right here in this area, and we may have jumped him, I don't know. And he may have been laying there. Mm-hmm. It may have been a different one also. But mm-hmm. one of the, the, the nice features that the trackers are really going to love about this app is our proof of life, proof of death. Mm-hmm. So uh, most viewers are going to be shocked. Some of them are not. Gonna, they know this. When we tell our recovery rates as a leash tracking dog, it's somewhere between – 35 40 percent roughly mm-hmm. and like oh wow should i figured it'd be higher than that <clears throat> well you got deer that are not dead so that accounts for part of the ones we don't recover you got property lines um you probably got deer that are missed that yeah. aren't even hit yeah. right yeah there's sure. instances where we've tracked deer and there's an arrow stuck in the tree they couldn't find the arrow and they they missed and it was clean arrows stuck in the tree and it was a <laughs> you know so there's a lot of reasons why you don't recover one. Mm-hmm. Just because they call you to track it doesn't mean the deer's dead. Right. Um, in most cases, is if a deer's dead and it's in a recoverable distance, like it didn't go on the neighbor's property and didn't go 10 miles away, we recover those deer. We find most of those deer. Mm-hmm. Now, in the, in the, uh, the way I always got you know, confirmation that a deer that I didn't recover was still alive or it was found you know, dead later in the season – it was up to the hunter to, hey, Shane, you tracked a deer for me you know, last month. I just want to let you know it showed back up on camera. Mm-hmm. Or my cousin shot it during rifle season. Mm-hmm. 
oh, thanks for letting me know. And so I kept track of that. And I, I had about 15 to 18% return of deer that I didn't recover were still alive mm-hmm. at the point that I was tracking them. So there was no way I was going to recover them. Right. Tracking buddy of, me, of mine in uh, Wisconsin, he, um, he actually calls all the hunters and finds out. And he has a much higher mm-hmm. um, percentage of deer that he tracked and didn't recover that were alive, actually, on, or on camera or shot mm-hmm. dead. So we built into the app for this to happen automatically. If you take a track, and once you finish it and it asks you, did you recover the deer, yes or no, you put no in 30 days, correct? Yep, 30, 30 days, the hunter gets a, a notification that says, hey, you had this deer, a tracker come out to track your deer back on this date. Have you seen that deer live on trail camera or did you find it dead? Did it get shot later in the season, yes or no? If they put yes, then a notification goes to the tracker and say, hey, that deer you tracked has been spotted alive or, or found dead or shot later in the season, whatever. Contact the hunter for more details. And so it gives us, it does that automatically. If the hunter says, no, I didn't see it, or I haven't found it, at the eight, eighth month mark, and that we, we picked that because up in the Midwest, that's, that's after the thaw. Mm-hmm. And so there's a good chance the hunters are going to find their deer. Um, in the south, it'll be thawed out long before that. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be any yeah, sunrise. Right. <laughs> but at the eight month mark, 240 days later, another notification goes out to the hunter. Hey, have you seen it by now? And, and the same process. And that's the final notification. So two of them go out. And we think that what we're going to see is a, a, a large number of the non-recoveries are going to be showing up on camera, shot by another hunter. They're going to be proven that they weren't actually um, fatal de- yeah, f- or dead at the point at mm-hmm. the time that we were tracking it. Yeah. And that's that you're going to see that that's why that recovery rate is so low of what you think it was. You now, for guys tracking off lead down south, they, they bay mm-hmm. sometimes. So their their recovery rate's usually higher than ours mm-hmm. up here on lead when we're tracking on lead. The thing is about tracking recovery percentage is if you're the hunter, you have to be realistic, I think, to the point you're just making. Mm-hmm. is You can't expect a tracker to have 100% right success like that's part of what they're coming out to prove and i think that's almost a a statistic that is skewed against the tracker i think if they're approved to be on this app which it sounds like there's you know a vetting process yeah they're not just gonna let anybody jump on here that's got a dog that thinks it can you know they think at least or the, the the tracker thinks they can be super effective right it's there's a process there the job of the tracker is not to find your deer it's to follow up and advance the track in a way that you can't because it's it's using a tool the dog Mm -hmm. to help follow up our goal our goal is to recover obviously but 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 that's not even realistic sometimes the deer's just not dead like like you're saying the better the better answer would probably we're, we're going to give you resolution we're resolution. going to give you a reason uh, yeah, an answer yeah. yeah yeah like i told Which you the deer is probably not dead you know was i a hundred percent sure no i wasn't but i was hopeful that based on the way she was tracking and the, and the clues and how far the deer had gone and the location you had video and, and i was worried about it being maybe a touch high hopefully hoping it got in there and we'd find it but you know and it turned out you know the way it did, turned out and so that's one thing we give us answer. A lot of people call us out and say, hey, I don't think I killed the deer. I think I hit it too high, but I just want to make sure. Can you come out? That's essentially what I was doing yep. when you came out with, with Keith and I. And I think that's just has to be a realistic expectation for the hunter. And I guess for those that have never used a tracking dog, knowing that this isn't this isn't going to be something that's just going to automatically make you find that deer. And and I think most right. people probably understand that, but if you're like, you, you can't be basically what I'm getting at is just don't be an asshole because these people are out here <laughs> trying to help you. You know right, what I exactly. mean? I think that's a big, big part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like and trackers are meant to help not make everything better. I suppose sometimes yeah, it's still right. going to hurt. Cause yep. I mean, I went through that, right. It's like, yeah, well, what you did for me last season was just confirm what I was already thinking. You helped yeah. confirm that theory. Re- reassured you that yeah, your line of thinking was probably correct. Mm-hmm. Right. 
and Shane was a friend, and you called him, mm-hmm. and you knew. I was at a volleyball right? game. Yeah, yeah. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> Rooks, but um, but if you don't know, if you don't know who to call, yeah. and you know to research and that, I mean, that's that's what's so great about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 one of the things the hunters are probably going to say when they get on this app when it launches, they're going to like, "There's nothing for me to do on it." Yeah, I created an account. Now what? I mean, I don't need to track your dog. And, and and like I said, it doesn't cost anything to create an account. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's nothing for the tracker at all, no fees, at least this year. Um, and I'll be honest with you, this was a very expensive uh, endeavor. And so mm-hmm. we do have to add some fees in somewhere, and we're trying to avoid them as, at all costs. Next year, there may be a fee for the trackers, a subscription like per year mm-hmm. or whatever. Um this year there's a small fee like for the hunter once they submit a request which is free and they have several trackers offer to take that track and they look at the trackers their ratings and reviews um you know their style whatever and everything about them and their fees and then they pick one at that point they pay a a small finder's fee to us Mm -hmm. to find them a tracker and that's just so we can pay for this app right it's not necessarily a pro- well, it's not a profitable thing, right? It's not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of yeah, and the so, two parties. Yeah, if we could have right. built this app for free and, did, and there would have well, been yeah. no charge. But the, the point I was after, uh, I wanted something that would make this more efficient. And make that really make the hunting community a better place to, to be, right? Yeah. Like, that, that just makes Make everything. everyone more efficient hunters. You're yeah. going to learn. And that's what I'm going to let Garrett and uh, Ryan talk about this is a side effect of the app – or kind of an indirect thing that's going to occur is all the data we collect. With the Minnesota yeah. Tracking Dogs website and that tracking request form, we collected data on, like, pass-throughs and broadheads and all that stuff. And I mm-hmm. said, you know what? We're, we're helping them get connected with trackers, hunters with trackers. Let's collect this stuff while we're at it. It's going to be free information, and we can give it back and say, hey, this is what we're finding out about certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, pass-throughs, like I learned are king everybody says shot placement what i'm seeing is it doesn't matter where you hit the deer if you get a pass through your odds of recovery just go way up no no matter where and so we're going to work on the analytics part Mm -hmm. and i'll let these two guys they're the brains um i'm just a tracker and they can dive into that a little bit now there will will be a subscription for that and that that's what we'll do once we get to that point we may just eliminate the fees altogether for Mm -hmm. using the app but for trackers and hunters to connect and then just use that to make money to improve the app and main, maintain the app because there's a cost to just maintaining that. Mm-hmm. At least then you'll have something to play with and yeah. you know, as a hunter. You, you can know, get on the app and yep. actually learn Start things. and set Filtering and s- out things. Sit, sure. sit in your deer stand while you're looking at your Rage 2 blade on your broad <laughs> hit, on your bow yeah. and, and you type in the scenario for your bow and say if a doe comes in a quarter and two at 20 yards with my setup Mm, maybe I shouldn't shoot her when she walks in. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. 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 I never but thought that, of it that You could way, play but, with yeah. stuff like that. I mean, yeah, but, but that's can. a great way to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And to your point earlier about you get the app, you make an account. Right now, there's nothing you can do on the app, but that's coming. That's yeah. what you're getting yeah, at. Yeah, so we're going to have something for you to uh, to dive into as far as yeah. the data. And yeah, leaks. I mean, as far as going through and filtering, and if you want to go through and look at, you know, the broadhead types, arrow. Um, I mean, we have different, so we even have firearms, bows, like, so the toolbox is pretty large um, going through, and we're going to expand onto that and try to get, you know, brands and, you know, put everything in Specifics. there. Specifics. Yeah, very much, yeah. But another part of it is pulling out that data, then we can do other things, pulling, you know, regressions and figure out, well, based on, what you used if it was a fixed blade or you know you shot quartering away in this shot placement um we could project possibly you know how far away the recovery would be Mm -hmm. you know potentially where would that you know range of that deer go and kind of um from there kind of provide some type of a a sweet spot you know as far as where the recovery would be it's Um, it's basically like that data that we posted on social media that we collected from minnesota where we kind of put our own little stats up there, percentages of pass-throughs and thoracic cavity and gut shots and all this stuff. But the, in the comments, you saw a lot of questions like, well, what was the percentage of this or what happened with this? Well, with the app, you're going to answer you, those yourself. You, you have just control choose. of You it. can filter yeah. that, yeah. essentially, yep. right? Yep. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, there's there's so much. I mean, if you, if you think outside the box, you could look at stuff that I think about. I guess, like does that we track don't go as far as bucks and you'll actually be able to see that or doe shot or buck shot in september versus one shot right. in the rut mm -hmm. the ones in the rut go a lot farther even yep. though they same exact injuries mm -hmm. you know double lung even lacerating the heart little deer in south carolina is where i grew up mm -hmm. and the deer are small you know one shot there and one shot here what's the average distance they run or you know mm -hmm. you'll, you can play around with stuff like that it yeah. doesn't have to be about Fixed versus mechanical. Right. Yeah. You could look at, um, you know, draw weights and, and, and arrow weights and compare mm -hmm. them. You can say. We even have how many blades on the broadhead yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we, we break it down pretty specific. Just in the time we've been sitting here, I created two two setups in the toolbox. So like we're saying, you download the app and there's nothing to do. Well, you can, you can add your stuff in. And then in the scenario where you do need a track and you make a new one, it's like, okay, we can. You know, plug in the location, and it'll default to your GPS location. Um, and then you go ahead, you, you put in the land type, public or private. Again, more inputs. Re request the reason that you need the tracker. What'd you shoot? We'll use the scenario of an antler deer. It automatically plugs in the current date and time. So, if, you know, if it was an hour ago, you can adjust that accordingly. Mm -hmm. You know, how high were you above the deer? And you got a little slider, 17 feet, shot distance. You can put that on the slider. Position of the animal, you put that in. And then you can, for the tracker's notes, you can plug in, you know, deer ran away tail high for 15 yards, then I lost sight of it, right? You put that detail in, that is something that the tracker's able to see. It doesn't necessarily get input into the data collection side. And then, oh, I just, I was using this weapon. Then you hit next, pass through or non, which like Shane was alluding to earlier, it's a pretty key metric. And then you can put in like, oh yeah, I definitely, you know, there's foul smell on the arrow. A lot of those additional things that would be really, again, helpful for the tracker to know, are there any property lines nearby? Certain states, you can track across the lines. Mm -hmm. You might need to get permission. Certain states, it's a hard no. Mm -hmm. um, and then the follow-up, if you do need to have permission, do you have it? No, but you can obtain it, yes, no. And then you can plug in your location for the impact, just based off of the grid here, mm -hmm. both for entry and exit and you can yeah. put in unsure if you don't actually know where it mm -hmm. exited as we all know sometimes what you think happened does not necessarily the reality exactly. of what yeah. happened especially when talking about the exit and, right? and the, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and the tracker's going to confirm this when he recovers it if he recovers it'll mm -hmm. ask him where the entry and exit okay. ones were so, so it'll, it'll be able to compare that yeah. and yeah. It'll, yeah. It'll, it'll overwrite that in the data it'll okay. say this was the actual entry and exit yep. Yep. And then the last things, you know, have you tracked the animal yet or not? And if you click yes, you know, how long did you wait? And you can mm -hmm. plug in some information there and how far you tracked it already. And that again may influence the tracker's decision-making process for when he actually, mm -hmm. you know, takes the track and starts tracking. And, uh, especially you that, can, that next one of how many hunters, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got 10 plus people grid searching. Yeah. You're like, ah, oh, last resort might as well, you know, throw a tracking yeah. request. Yeah. All that. You just, you just, contaminated the whole woods mm -hmm. with a lot of scent mm -hmm. and have you made any efforts to uh to find the animal past last blood like searching then, water sources and whatnot yeah mm -hmm. and then you can upload additional images and so if you have like like oh this is what the blood looked like at the impact you can upload that or a small video you might yep. have shot footage that's yeah. what we would love as mm -hmm. trackers and so many people are using gopros and cell phones mm -hmm. and stuff these yeah. days when i get video from a a hunter showing the shot. I love that because mm -hmm. then I can make a decision. But what happens when you text it to a hunter or or, or however you send it, messenger, it's it usually compressed, compressed and it's not mm -hmm. high quality. This allows for full resolution, uncompressed mm -hmm. transfers. Yep. Hit yeah. submit, and then that's it. You get and a notification. I just yeah, got, you got a notification. Tracker, you, that's you got hilarious. Notification I, there. I yeah. saw that pop yeah. up, and I'm like, <laughs> I bet it is. Sure enough. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, somebody needs a tracking dog. Yeah. And here's a question or, or a criticism, probably someone out there watching this or listening to it is going to say, I don't have time to ask, answer all those questions. I, I just want a, a tracker out here. Mm -hmm. Trust me, the, the, tr the tracker is going to ask He's you all ask those you. questions on the phone. And then he finds out, okay, it's a gut shot. I can't track and I had track tomorrow. I have to work. Mm -hmm. You've got to call someone else. Yep. You're going to call the next tracker. You're going to go through all that again or different varieties mm -hmm. of questions. Oh, and you're it's, just going to burn so much time yeah. where, you know, coyotes could get to it or yeah. it mm -hmm. could 
I mean, there's well, so you fill that out once in 30, 45 seconds. It goes to if there's 100 trackers in your region, it goes to all of them. You've told all of them, all 100 mm-hmm. trackers, the same story in one instance. So there's a huge benefit bit to, uh, benefit to that. Mm-hmm. Did we and mention then, the offline? Oh, no, we didn't. So go ahead. Yeah, so you, you'll be able to go through and do, you know, that full request offline. So there's That's offline cool. capability, yeah. So whenever you get into service, then it will push through. Um, so so kinda, it kind of stores all that yep. while you're... It caches it. So yep. that was one of the things. It costs extra money to build that. But what happens mm-hmm. if you have one bar and you're trying to text a tracker or mm-hmm. call it and you keep getting dropped and then if they're not available you got to go to the next one well you can open the app create that whole uh, tracking request hit submit and it'll say you do not have cell service at this time but as soon as we get it we'll send it and it's trying to send it in the background you get a bar it sends a little bit of info it's basically how you send a text and it's always mm-hmm. trying to send it and you finally gets through mm-hmm. yeah It'll eventually get through. And so maybe you're driving to sales service, but in the meantime, you've already got that request out. Mm-hmm. And 10 minutes later, you come into sales service and bam, three notifications come by yeah. that mm-hmm. back to you that trackers are available. Mm-hmm. And so you saved a little bit of time there. Yeah, that's that's all really huge. I mean, thinking of so many situations where... We've been there. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, thinking about, you know, a lot of times to uh, an app for a state will have a similar thing mm-hmm. where it's like checking in your game, like your mm-hmm. electronic mm-hmm. game check. It's the same thing where a lot of times as you walk up out of the bottom and you get to the top of the ridge, you look and you're like, Oh, nice. It went through mm-hmm. same thing for this, where maybe you're tracking or you get down out of your stand or whatever. And you're down the bottom, you walk to the top, you've already got yeah. all that done. Yep. And it, it's, that's pretty slick. And the offline thing obviously is a huge deal for hunters. And I know, uh, when, talking about like on x for yep. example oh, same thing absolutely. sometimes people will be like i was well, getting ready to mention that yeah yes. like what do you do when yeah. <laughs> when there's no cell phone service how do you use your map it's like well actually mm-hmm. you can still use it and i mean same for this so that's yeah yeah huge. you you won't be as a tracker you won't be able to accept requests because the situation may have changed it may not be available anymore but the important thing is as a hunter in low service area you'll be able to get that mm-hmm. request mm-hmm. out and alert trackers hey mm-hmm. this guy needs our help you know, or alert trackers that I'm in need of help or whatever. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as like the data side of things, like mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you guys are most excited about? I mean, obviously you've talked about, is there anything else that you guys are excited about that us as hunters will be able to explore and like, or even just some of the findings that you've already started learning from, the experiences trackers yeah. have had before this app well i think one of the cool things will be is just being able to go through and filter through some of this data once we get that in and then having some type of a like a, a likelihood or probability of recovery mm-hmm. so being able to go through your exact setup yeah with you know, a, with a tracking dog yeah right the right key, the key right the key yes to yes yeah absolutely yeah that is a pretty interesting and i'm sure we'll all learn from that right like yeah. you can just sit there and scroll through all these different mm-hmm. scenarios and i think that's pretty sweet because you only have as much experience as like what you can remember yourself or sometimes what your buddies have had happen right right, like right there's only so many experiences we have but if you can draw up these different scenarios and just punch them in theoretically yeah that's pretty sweet and we we're talking about having the yeah. sample size listed as well too. So if you, lay, if you yes. lay out a hyper specific set of scenarios and it's like, there's been three tracks that have yeah. Yeah. extended criteria, well, that's not very helpful. Right. Right. That's pretty much the same as talking to your buddy mm-hmm. who had the thing happen mm-hmm. three times. Mm-hmm. But if it's like, Oh, you know, this is your, this is the average probability of recovery or the average actuals based on, you know, 5,500 tracks that met that same criteria. Okay. That's pretty good statistical mm-hmm. power. Mm-hmm. And then like, I'm definitely the type of guy that I would just sit there, you know, scrolling through different scenarios and right. playing like, Oh, how likely are people to recover a deer? You know, if they shot it from 30 feet up versus and else try ground sits mm-hmm. like, Oh, ground sit might be, you know, 5% higher odds of recovery right. or, mm-hmm. or whatever. But the point is you can just play around with those different scenarios mm-hmm. and, and really kind of do some learning with a little bit better sample size. Yeah. I think that's a really big deal. Yeah, I'm I'm most excited about just the raw data and mm-hmm. filtering through that. But I do like the the probability thing that we've yeah. talked about because I I do see trends as a tracker. Typically, I see deer when they're running. 
away from a hunter after they've been shot once they establish a direction and you know and i know from different shots how far they usually are like if if it's a gut shot and you didn't track them right away we usually find them within 250 yards or so of that direction Mm -hmm. and so and then a different shot may be you know 800 yards and, and and so you could use that to produce like a cone like garrett's mentioned before to me and you know cone of recovery uh, probability, distance, mm-hmm. you know, this is not a sure thing, but this, if you can't find a tracker and you have to grid search, it helps you narrow down the right. search area. Mm-hmm. That's, it's Yeah, it, it could act as a tool for, yeah. Absolutely. Even if you don't, don't have the yeah, tracker. Yeah, you don't have the tracker. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. going to answer so many questions with uh, with the data that's going to come yeah. uh, come back. Like, what happens when you see a post on, on Facebook or social media with someone saying, I, I can't find my deer? And anyway, the first response is, go check near water. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I don't no. find very many deer <laughs> near water. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's like 2% of the deer I find are within 50 yards of water. And Minnesota and Wisconsin, the land area, like surface area water. is 30% water. <laughs> yeah, you know? right. So shouldn't we find about 30% of the deer near water or even yeah. higher if they're going right. there intentionally? So I think it'll kind of prove those theories either true or false. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there's a lot of – as as we all know, there's a lot of things that get tossed around pretty loose, and like yeah. that example exactly, people start hearing it a few times, and then it becomes this mm-hmm. very common answer to a really advanced problem, right? right. It's like, right. yeah, the deer went that way. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll just go check down by the water. It's yeah. like, well, water's, if it was, water's 300 yards that way. Yeah, yeah, it's like, if it was that easy, then, you know, people yeah. would probably find a hell of a lot more deer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are instances where you do find yeah. near water, and sometimes that's because the deer has thicker cover. We've talked about that yeah. in previous pa- uh, podcasts. That's where the cover's at near mm-hmm. water. But it's not because there's water there they're going there necessarily. At least mm-hmm. I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a year or two, three years when this app is collected, you know, 100,000 mm. track request, and you're seeing the trends that, you know, 80, 90% of the deer track don't end up near water, then this pretty much proves that that's not a reliable search method if mm-hmm. you're searching blindly. You know, mm-hmm. maybe 90% of the time search away from water mm-hmm. <laughs> if yeah. that's the case. Yeah, I yeah. think that that's really interesting. And, and you brought up something good, interesting too, uh, you know, a time of year aspect, right? How many times do we talk about discussions that, we're talking broadheads with, with the guys, and you're like, well, with this type of broadhead, I only see him run this far. Well, what time of year was that? Yeah. yeah. You know, you could have the same broadhead type, five deer mm-hmm. each scenario. The five in November mm-hmm. ran 200 yards, and the five in September went 40. You got to mm-hmm. think bigger than that, 5,000. Yeah, right, exactly, right. with the app. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you start factoring in the pass-through, and we know, like, as far as how far they actually run, as far as recoveries and that, <clears throat> I think I think we mentioned that in the last – podcast that we did there was and what was it like a hundred yard difference or something i think between between pass throughs yeah 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 we and we theorized that it was because the arrow was in them and it keeps them moving uh they can't bend down it's not that it's doing more damage or anything it's right. just it keeps them on the move you got something stuck in them and it's not until and usually as a tracker when we find an arrow where it pulled out or something usually you find that the deer it finally bedded down and died not far past mm-hmm. that yeah that's one of those things that I think also uh, is kind of like a generalization. Well, if my arrow's still in them, it's still cutting. What's your opinion on that? As a, as a tracker, oh, as somebody who's seen I've a lot. I've never seen it doing much any more, more damage. additional yeah. damage. I've seen one instance where, one instance that I can recall that the arrow did any additional damage, and that's it went through the hind quarter. It was quartering away. And the arrow, some, I think, oh, it poked out the front and snapped off. And then it pulled back through because it was in the hip. And as the deer ran, it was wrapping it back and forth. And it cut uh, cookie cutter holes through the lungs. Interesting. And uh, and that was all the other deer I've I've recovered, like the arrow broke off, you know, it went in eight inches or backed out. You'd still only see one hole going in and out. That's the thing. And we take pictures. I would. Uh, when we gut it, field dress it, we'd take pictures of the organs. You could see a clean, just one cut of the blade, and that was it. It was not if, moving yeah, around. Yeah, if it's not a pass-through, and that you still aren't getting that additional blood or whatever that's, that's you know, it, it could be potentially moving around in there. I think what it is, the blade gets in there, and the yeah. organs and everything are just kind of moving, moving together. With it, yeah. And then it, 
you think when that, that arrow sticking out of the body hits a tree, it's going to go like that. Right. No, it just snaps right here, and this mm-hmm. doesn't really move. Mm-hmm. Take an arrow and put, like, a lung from a gut shot. I mean, a, a deer you shot. And then hit that right there. You know, it's not going to cut oh, up yeah. through the lung. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, you're going to snap the arrow, and that's what it's going to do like that. Yeah, I don't so know it's not that really going to move around much. Aside from, you know, shooting one with a gun, I don't know that I've ever got in there and thought, oh, yeah, that those lungs are just obliterated because the arrow was mm-hmm. cutting yeah. constantly. Now, the only reason I bring that up is I feel that that is a um, – another one of those common things that people say, it's just like, Oh, generalize. Well, it's still just cutting in there. And I don't actually at this point believe that to be true very often. I'm not saying it can't like you use the example where you did see that, but no, I that wasn't the that blade. That was just the arrow shaft. Right. Pizza and cutting out back, of how coming, many traps. Yeah. yeah. You know. And that was the arrow was embedded in the hind legs. That's, cranking you know as it runs Mm -hmm. you know this the side of the ribs it's not there's not a whole lot of movement as the deer runs Mm -hmm. you know so that was an oddity you know just that everything lined up but in most cases like i said well in all cases i have never seen what appears to be an indication of more cutting going on Mm -hmm. so then in defense of the pass through you would much just rather have the pass through again because to have the arrow in there isn't a do- doing any additional damage, and when you have two holes, yeah. it's just allowing for more blood loss. Right. And a pass through means that you went through all You've, the entire organ, yeah. uh, you know, cavity or the mm-hmm. uh, thoracic cavity or wherever you hit it, instead of hitting seventy five percent or fifty percent of the mm-hmm. organs, you went through one hundred percent of them, and you have the other, other hole for blood to come out of to help you sight track. So earlier today we did a podcast about frontal shots and kind of the evolution of why we decided to start doing that how we set up our arrows and broadheads to better i guess suit that shot Mm -hmm. what's been your experience with quarter two frontal shots where bone is hit what are some of the experiences you've seen there like would you say generally speaking arrows are getting in there far enough if they were to hit the front side shoulder on a quartering two shot or what, what generally happens or do what, you see that very often at I, all? I, I don't have a whole lot of tracks for frontal shots, but the ones I do, a lot of times it ends up being deflections just based on the shape of the deer in the front. Mm-hmm. Um, we have recovered some that got in there, you know, um, but my, I'm, I'm kind of a advocate against frontal shots um, I don't know. They just, they're just a, a coin toss to me. Mm-hmm. It just seems like you, you a high risk have a high risk of a deflection just because of the narrow shape of the rib cage right there mm-hmm. and all the cartilage and everything that's going on. It just seems like a low odds thing. But now, uh, is that in reference to tree stands or ground or both? You know, I, I really don't know because uh, trying to think of all the frontal shot requests I've gotten um, – I think most of them were in the tree. I think some I of them may have been on the ground. I'm not sure. And that that could play a part, could, especially because not only does the chest cavity look like this, but it kind of slopes under. So mm-hmm. a, a shot coming down could be more prone to deflection or just mm-hmm. sliding right up under the, the shoulder of the, mm-hmm. the of the deer. Yeah, and kind of being on one side or the other, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not I sure. I think I may have only tracked a few, and I think I only recovered one frontal shot deer. That, I mean, yeah, yours was kind of a frontal shot, but not really. It was kind of quartered in two, and mm-hmm. it was more high than it was anything. I think if you'd hit a little lower, you wouldn't even know on the phone with me. It, no. no, I just needed to be about that much lower. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I, at least for the style of hunting that I do, I'm all about the frontal shot. I'm really, as I'm seeing more and more examples of it, mm-hmm. believing that it is the It seems to be if you, if you don't have a deflection, if you, you know, if it goes in, mm-hmm. those deer are usually very recoverable, mm-hmm. high odds of recovery. Yeah, and to the point, too, where it's fast. Like, yeah. Best, I mean, best right. blood, all my best blood trails on any deer have always been yeah. hitting yeah. them right in the chest. Yeah. So you, so you are for the frontal shot. But to your point earlier, with, like, not from a really steep yep. downward angle, but where right. you can actually, like my North Dakota buck last year, the arrow was lodged in the back of the hip. Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing really to slow it down. Yeah. And what was that arrow set up? 
that was 420 grains, like really? 15% front of center and mechanical. Little, little one, uh, one and a half incher. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But that deer, I mean, yeah, hip locked up and he only went 50 yards, blood everywhere and tipped over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's going to be a question that people ask me all the time. You know, what, what kind of mechanical would you recommend? If, if I, if I had to re, uh, recommend a mechanical, it would be that sever. Those, yeah. those are really tough. Every one I've tracked for has been, um, it's done a lot of damage. It's been passed throughs almost every time on yep. the deer. Um, I mean that they're they're built tough. Mm-hmm. I'm not an advocate, uh, a no big advocate of mechanicals in general. But if I had to recommend one, that's the one I would recommend. That's one I would shoot if yeah. I had to. Yeah, that's what Jake actually just mentioned that one as well. He said that that one seems to be the one in the half. I don't know about the twos. They're getting a little, you know, yeah. too wide, and then you start hurting penetration. <laughs> I think. Well, that was. Going back to the stats, circling back to that, if mm-hmm. I remember right from the stats you guys had done initially from the web entries, pass-throughs had a really high, mm-hmm. like a noticeable recovery boost. Yep. And mechanicals and fixed, it was less clear, but if you had mechanicals and pass-through, the oh, odds yeah. were very good. Yeah, it was like mm-hmm. a hundred, near 100%. Or, I mean, it was like super high right. odds of recovery. And that, that's where the, the mechanicals shine on the non-pass-throughs where the fixed didn't do so well in recoveries. But at the same time, the reason you weren't getting a pass through was because you were shooting a mechanical. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of, you know, catch-22 there. Yeah. When you're looking at this, the one thing that can be a little uh, misleading potentially for like a frontal shot, for example, mm-hmm. if I take a frontal shot from here to the wall on one of these mounts and just absolutely tendering it and it dies in 50 yards – I'm not calling a tracker. Right. That's exactly so, it. So here's a question. If I create an account on there, can I just punch in all of the hunts that I have where things go well? Like if I make a shot, like, that would that would also help build that. If, if it isn't I got, a thing, I got maybe, what you're that's, maybe that's and something that could help. At this point, no, but that is something we plan to add. So mm-hmm. we, you know, like I said, this is an expensive endeavor. And we had to kind of pick and choose what we wanted. Oh, sure, we would like to have the app to this point and mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. But um, we have discussed plans for, like, allowing trackers to input tracks they took off the app. Like, mm-hmm. they got a direct mm-hmm. call and put it into their data to, mm-hmm. to help them. Um, we had that with the Minnesota Tracking Dogs. Uh, uh, had a general submission mm-hmm. where if you didn't need a tracking dog, you could say, I shot a doe, tracked this far, I hit her here. And we were collecting that data. And we, I think I had 85 people submit something for that. And so we were doing that too. And that, you know, that's something we look at in the long term, um, you know, of all the things we have to add to the app or want to. Mm-hmm. That'll be one, one of the things we potentially add is a, a, a manual. And we would keep those separate. Yes, yeah. So yeah. it would be like here's manual su- submissions without dogs. And you could actually compare them and say, okay, yep. We're seeing similarities. Doesn't yeah. matter if there's a dog involved or not. Um, yeah. If you hit a deer here with this type of setup, it does goes about the same distance, mm-hmm. or you have the same re, uh, results. Yeah, I think that would be interesting as well, just because um, I think there are a lot of shots that happen that yeah, when when it goes well, nobody really learns from. I shouldn't say nobody learns from them, but it's harder to learn from them. It's like when they go a little weird where. Maybe yeah. it goes further than what you thought, or the blood wasn't that good, but it really, in the long run, only went 100 yards yeah. or whatever. Those are the ones I feel like we learn from the most because those are the ones that confuse us. The ones that you watch the deer go down mm-hmm. or there's just an absurd amount of blood, yeah, we learn from those, but we really learn from the oddball ones because yep. we make mental notes as we're going through you know those tracks and we're like, yeah, <laughs> or, or there's stuff that you reference of like, well, right. but that one time... Yep. There was no blood, but, you know, he ran 150 yards mm-hmm. and found him dead, and it was a perfect shot. So I think it, it's it's kind of interesting to think of it from that perspective, yeah. too, and I think, um, it, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it'd just, be fun for the hunter to be able to go back almost like it's documented, mm-hmm. you, you know, and, and actually having the, the grid placement and everything of where you shot it, where the exit was, what your setup was, you know, five years ago when yep. you shot the deer, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, um, there's a lot of things we plan to add to this. Yeah. We have, a, a you know, notes and like this would be cool to add. I mean, we've thought as much as possible. We had trackers as a test group. We have yep. hunters as a test group, you know, giving us input. 
and we tried to mm-hmm. make sure we in, you know incorporated everything we could but at the same time we're going you know a year from now two years from now this would be a cool feature to add you know and what you said about putting my or your own stats in there that would be nice to have because there wasn't a dog involved mm-hmm. but on the other side there's going to be some people that say hey these stats don't really mean a whole lot because there was a dog involved right and the, my rebuttal is that dog gave us an answer. You know, oh, yeah. It, the dog was used on all these tracks, and they have a better chance of proving that deer was dead or alive than you, than, you know, 10,000 of mm-hmm. sight mm-hmm. trackers. Right, And totally. so it's better to have the stats the sample from size tracking dogs. so large. Oh, yeah, and, and that too. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. I, I think that uh, it's pretty interesting how much we learn from those from the ones where we need the dog though too Mm -hmm. right like i always come back to that where i feel that i'm taking pictures video more and more because i want to be able to go back and reference those memories that you know you kind of lose it i mean obviously okay so let me use it this example when you see a ton of blood you remember that okay this is a lot Mm -hmm. compared to everything else i've seen but on the other hand some of the tracks that we've all been on over the years it's like I mean, I th- yeah. I th- the shot looked good. It sounded good. But this isn't like the last double lung deer I shot. <laughs> that last one Start was... having doubts. Yeah. yeah, stuff was spraying. And yeah, you have doubts. And that is not a fun place to be. Right. But the more experience you get and if you can reference these things, it's going to mm-hmm. help your confidence mm-hmm. or help keep you in check and help you keep mm-hmm. a realistic expectation if it's maybe too high. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and yeah. and like here, here's one thing that you just jog my memory on you know that this is going to show hunters when they when they start seeing the data and stuff um or i don't know how it would work out but like your experience when you're tracking when do you start finding blood after you shoot a deer usually a ways down the track yeah it's you i used to think you know because i'd I'd shoot deer and i'd start finding blood relatively quick but you know all the tracks i've been on you know there's a hunter out there he's tracking he's not finding any blood and he's like oh did i miss you know whatever and then we get out there with the dog, we're called in there, and then there's like 30 yards past where you stop, mm-hmm. deer opened up. Mm-hmm. And then you, and, you know, and hunters are going to learn that. Like, they don't necessarily start bleeding immediately. One of the Sometimes most, it's 30, 50 yards down mm-hmm. the trail. One of the most interesting things I've picked up on is it seems that the quicker the arrow passes through, like if you get the broadside shot and you just, it's almost like that's when it takes the longest to start bleeding. I don't know if you guys have had a similar experience like that or not, but one I shot in Iowa in 2018, I mean, it was exactly where I'd want to put it 10 times out of 10. And the buck ran 100, I probably ran 200 yards, but there was no blood for like probably 60 yards. That's a long ways. But then when it started opening up, it was like somebody just had unplugged. was it pretty far forward? Pretty like far feet, forward. Okay, so you had a lot of tissue mm-hmm. overlap. Yeah, which noticed, is probably a part I, I of tend that. To, I tend to hit a little bit far forward on mm-hmm. average, and there's a lot of deer I shoot. It's like <laughs> I'm the it could opposite. be 30, 50 yards down the trail before, oh, here's some blood. Yeah, yeah. which is really weird but, and, and stressful. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the one I shot last year was so is broadside and figured he would have just collapsed. So I'm running. Ended up in the morning finding him. He was probably about 300 yards, and I found no blood. Um, ended up hitting one lung and it had all three blades on the liver like it went through but it didn't go through it somehow it like pushed it out hmm. Pop, I don't know I don't I can't even explain it we were looking at it but there was zero blood on that thing I could not find anything hmm. so I don't know about myself I mean they're so sporadic sometimes yeah. they, they start bleeding immediately sometimes they it's a dribble the entire way you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, so, just enough to keep you but going. But the one either. trend that, that sticks is it's usually, you know, down the trail before I finally start really picking up blood. Mm-hmm. Um, to where you really get the gauge of yeah, I may are we find good it, or are we not good? Yeah, I may know? find the arrow laying in the ground, which but, I usually get passed through. Uh, the only few times I didn't get passed through, I was experimenting with uh, mechanicals at mm-hmm. one point in my life. But um, I think 99% of the time shooting them fixed, I've gotten pass throughs. And, yeah, there's an arrow there with blood that I can expect, and that's what I like about pass throughs. I can smell it. Oh, yeah. I can look at it. But there's never, like, just pouring blood right out the gate. It's usually down the trail. At least a few steps, yeah. right? I feel like it's almost always, almost always, at least a couple steps before it actually reaches the ground, which makes sense. The only time 
I've noticed it's immediate is when it's real high pressure blood. So mm-hmm. frontal shots are a mm-hmm. good example yep. of that where when we were talking about We don't frontal, get called for those. No, right, that's, right. that's, guys, that's exactly. a thing, though. That's, <laughs> and that's, that is a thing. The guy says, hey, yeah. I, I may have hit it in the artery. I don't know. There's a lot of blood here. I was like, if you hit it in the artery... You wouldn't be calling yeah, me. You'd yeah. see him out in front right. of you. He's yeah, they don't bit. make it very far. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like the first 15 minutes of trying to find blood is me just, I'm in the wrong spot. Yeah. It ends up being like five yards further back or something. That's, you yeah. know. perfect example is yeah. uh, my daughter, that deer, she shot with her bow just last year. Just doing circles. I had video of it, and like an idiot, I didn't go back, and what, I thought I knew exactly where that deer went. And we went into this tall like canary grass where it ran. And looking, and my my daughter uh, daughter's just a little nut back there. She's like, I don't see any blood. I was like, I don't either. We'll just keep walking. Uh, it went right through here, right? It's not dead. I must have missed it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she knew good and well. She smoked it. I mean, <laughs> and so we were finally. I found some blood, and I'm like, oh, we were in the wrong spot. We were yeah. 20 yards away yeah. from where we should have been. And once we found it, though, it was pretty easy yeah. following mm-hmm. it. And there was the deer. I almost stepped on it. I had the light, and the deer had <laughs> you know stood like this, and I guess it tumbled over here. And so the blood was on the right of the trail. And so yeah. I'm looking at the blood. And I'm like, oh, here's more blood up here a lot. It must have stood here. <laughs> and daughter says, look to your left. And I looked. And there it was laying right <laughs> yeah. beside me. But I was tunnel vision on that deer. But I had an experience like that with my dad a long time ago. I was probably in high school. And we were sitting on my grandpa's property, different ends of the property. He calls me. And my dad has, which I do it now, too. It's funny. You know, or at least for me, I just grew up to be exactly like my dad to the point of, even the things that at times annoy me about oh. him, I'm that. So he calls me and he's all stressed out. I don't think I put a good shot on him. I don't think I put a good shot on him. And he's like, he ran, you know, he, I get to where he was and he tells me the story and he made the shot. The buck ran out and made just a, a quick, you know, spin out and stop. And then he shot at it again and it was pretty far and he missed low. And then it ran into a patch of pines. And, uh, he he kept telling me that he he just didn't think that the initial shot was good, but he knew he'd hit it, but he he didn't think it was good. And we didn't really find any blood, and we're going in the edge of that stuff. And I remember I was ahead of him, and I had a light, and I'm looking down through there, and I go. And, I mean, it is like <laughs> yeah. they're near yeah. touching me, and I was like, Ugh, you know. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, just perfect shot. I mean, straight double long and mm-hmm. truly – what would have probably happened, and my guess, and what our both of our assumption was after the fact was, had he not shot at it the second time, it was going to fall right there because yeah. it just, right. you know, it's such that's, a perfect shot. A, the it made issue. it another 10 yards. You that's know? A, the issue sometimes was take, trying to get that other shot in there, and that's cost me before. I, I shot a deer years ago when I was a teenager, and it ran a little bit and stopped, and I'm like, did I miss or not, or did I hit it? I was like, I better you know, shoot at it again or try to get another shot in it. And I certainly missed this time. And all I did was spook the deer. Yep. And I had a heck of a track job on me. Had I not <laughs> even bothered shooting. But at the same time, you know, had I not shot again, and it may have been I didn't have a great shot. I had a, a if you injury, have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, why didn't I take the opportunity? And then it then it ended up tracking it forever anyway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but it's just <laughs> that made me remind me of that funny yeah. issue back then. I was well, Ted just, with his muzzle loader. Buck, I mean, oh, yeah. he just grazed it, right? Oh, yeah. First. Did, yeah. So wouldn't have been If you didn't have, have that anything, second. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm I'm a big uh, believer in follow-up shots if you got the mm-hmm. opportunity, especially when you know you hit them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one thing if you, if you miss them and you just shoot, then it's irresponsible. You know, it can be irresponsible too, but right. if you know you hit them, which is easier to know with a bow than with a gun a lot of times, but with a bow, if you got another opportunity and mm-hmm. he's in your range, like, Especially if it's in, if it's, especially if it's, I always think of the example, if like I were to hit one back and I got another opportunity, by all means, I'm taking as far of a shot as I possibly can. I mean, every time, but I was yeah, going mean, to, you, you, you want to try to, you know, put them down as ethically oh, yeah. as possible, especially I mean, if you got a gut shot, mm-hmm. they're going to live, you know, 10, 12 right. or and more I mean, hours. I wouldn't shoot at a deer through the timber you know, 65 yards mm-hmm. away on my first shot. But I, you know, I think one of the main reasons to practice at longer ranges is if you have to make a follow-up shot, you can at sure. least be confident mm-hmm. that you can make that shot. Mm-hmm. So like thinking of looking out in the window here and just thinking about how many obstacles could be in the way, if there's a chance, man, I'm sending that on, especially if I know I hit him back, like in yep. the guts or something, right. just because at any cost, I want that deer to not have to suffer 
especially because of my own mistake. I just think that's terrible. Mm-hmm. I, I hate that. Um, one I question. To, I need Go to ahead. apologize. I was out here piddling my phone, but I was trying to get your screen record going again. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> so people watching like, Shane's not even listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm screen recording yeah. this so he can show you guys what the app looks like. But So if you guys are like thinking back to before all of the information, all the conversations, like what are some of the changes that you've made, especially you to your setup over the years to try to maximize your, I guess, kill efficiency because of what you've learned through tracking and, and kind of everybody. And I, I guess quickly I'll, I'll share mine. I've just always been a fan of, uh, fixed blade broadheads. My dad actually never let me use a mechanical when I was growing up. He was so against them. He had had his experiences with other people tracking deer that they had shot with mechanicals. And uh, He's probably from that generation. Of deer. There used to be like a, a big push against them when they first came on the market. He was, ve- he was always very against them. Like, it yeah. was not a question. We weren't allowed to use those. So I just never did use them. And then when I moved to Iowa... I shot two bucks with mechanicals and both results were not good. And they were pretty much exactly what my dad warned me against. I shot one in Nebraska in 2017, real close broadside, low tree stand. Everything was really close and that worked great. The deer only went like 40 yards, but that was really the only good experience I had. And I had already planned to switch most of the season back Mm -hmm. to a replaceable blade, uh, fixed blade, like a slick trick. I'd use thunderheads and slick tricks. And then I learned about single bevels. And then since then I've just become obsessed with the single bevel broadhead. Weights will vary a little bit anywhere from 550 to down to 500, but that's kind of been the adjustment that I've made. Curious what your guys' thought and adjustment is. I I wouldn't say that I've made a huge amount of adjustment. I have increased the weight of my arrows. Mm-hmm. Um, I went too far, I believe, and, and then I backed back off. So I went from I was shooting like a four hundred and five grain arrow. Mm-hmm. I was all about speed. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that's what I used yeah. to be when I was younger. And then uh, as I got a little older, I wasn't so concerned about that as far as I wanted a, a nice straight tune in my arrow. I made a setup in my garage for paper to shoot through. Mm-hmm. And then I started going with a little heavier air, a little more FOC. I went a little too far from my liking. I didn't, it didn't negative, uh, well, it didn't affect me severely negatively. I, I did notice that, you know, I don't shoot past 30 yards or 40 yards really with, with my bow anyway. So I wasn't worried about the long range aspect. But, um, I just felt like I wanted a little bit more speed back in my setup. So I backed it down to about 550 grains, mm-hmm. that happy place. My arrows fly well. I'm I'm always going to fix uh, shoot a fixed blade. Well, I shouldn't say always. The severs got me intrigued. Um, I, I, do, I do know from experience tracking that guys that can get a pass through with a bigger cutting diameter head do fare better, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I could get a mechanical or or just a wider fixed head mm-hmm. flying true, um, I'd probably go that route. If I, As long as I can guarantee pass-throughs almost every time. That's mm-hmm. my big thing now. And just just trying to maximize that. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too big and sacrifice having a, a, a partial, you know, a, a non-pass-through with air sticking mm-hmm. in it. I hate those. I mean, mm-hmm. when I'm tracking them, um, nothing, I mean – it's always better when I have a pass through my odds of recovery with a dog are, are so much better without a dog. They're so much better. Um, so I'm afraid of non pass throughs, but at the same time, I see the benefits of a, a bigger cutting diameter mm-hmm. broadhead. So I haven't changed it a whole lot over the years. I have backed away from the speed and got a little bit heavier arrows and I've stuck with, with fix. I did go from, I won't shoot the little, um, prepackaged razor blades that you snap mm-hmm. together. I only shoot a solid, you know, a solid two blade fix. Um, that's all I shoot right now. So like um, a cut on contact. Yeah. Right um, like I'm, I'm shooting the old Zwickies. Yep. I shoot them in my recurve and I yeah. shoot them in my compound. Yeah. Um, so there, I like those. I had some, uh, is it Grizz, Grizzly stick? Yeah. No, not Grizzly stick. Grizzlies. 
I think it's another Grizzlies. bread. Yeah. yeah, they look like tough heads. Mm -hmm. And it may be cheaper still. I don't know. They cost a lot less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I shot uh, a Nebraska deer with those. I've shot those at a few deer and, and killed some does and stuff with them. I like those. I like the the low angle of attack, yeah. that mm -hmm. mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, Z the Zwickies, are, I haven't had an issue with those, and they're only $5 each. <laughs> and, <laughs> and every deer I've shot with them, and I don't know what they're made of, they've held up really well. Yeah, I've only yeah. had to just kind of touch them up a little bit, and that's, the that's, tips are not bending over or anything. That's really good. Mm -hmm. yep. so can't what about you, that. Ryan? I think my biggest thing has just been getting my boat like really tuned out. Mm -hmm. um, every year is always a battle to – uh, you put your broadhead on, and then you have planing, and you just aren't hitting in the right spots. And yep. uh, you're you're moving your rest around, and you know, and it's kind of becoming crunch time. But um, no, I I worked with my uh, um, buddy this year that he he spent way too much time tuning out my bow, but it made a it made a world of difference. Yeah. Um, even even down to the arrows, um, just getting them clocked right. You know, we went from a right helical to a left helical. It went to a four. Um, for Fletch, but, um, but I mean, they shoot so true. And even, even the bad shots are just a lot closer, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, um, not a foot stray. It's a, a yeah. When you, you know, you had a bad shot and you go to the target and you look and you're like, Oh, I'm only, yeah, a few inches low, right. not, you know, eight inches or something. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I kind of started getting into having like target panic from just shooting too much mm -hmm. and, you know, shooting like couple hundred arrows a day sometimes and it's just you just get bad form and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was uh it's target panic and it took me probably two years i mean i i'm still i guess recovering from it right <laughs> you know it's like so i switched to a back tension uh -huh. um did that a lot through the winter um last year and then uh um uh, continue to do it, but then I've I've kind of been able to adapt my thumb release to to work as a back tension, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's just made a world of difference. Uh, and and I'd, I'd say the other part of this too is just knowing as far as shot placement and when, like yeah. that's huge. I always kind of went with the weight teller quartering away, and you, you know, and just try to get that shot. But um, uh, at, from my experience now, it's just I just want a good broadside shot. You, you know, it's that's really just picking the right shot and, and knowing mm -hmm. when not to shoot. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I really like about being on the ground and that shot placement aspect is all I want is them to be close. Yeah, give me any angle. Honestly, yeah. If I got if I got the broadhead and setup that I have right now, mm -hmm. just bring them in, mm -hmm. and it's like then I'm not really worried about all that much because I know that puppy's punching mm -hmm. through there. Now, on the other hand, if I was only shooting, like if I have a shoulder injury instead of a knee injury, and yeah. I'm only shooting, you know, 40 pounds on a, on a draw weight, that's going to be a totally different story. But with the bow setup that I have, mm -hmm. but, you know, I don't have a super long draw length and draw weight doesn't really matter that much, but just being able to push an arrow pretty quickly and bring them inside of yeah. 15 yards. It's like, I'm not really worried about too much, but I also hunt off the ground almost right. exclusively. Yeah. And I think that changes a lot of things. And one of the reasons I do that is I hate trying to shoot at deer from a tree stand. That's a fun fact about me. Cause <laughs> I don't like shooting at a deer from a tree stand. It freaks my brain out to like turn that deer mm -hmm. and have that visual. Yeah, that's I, 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 I'm picturing what you're yeah, no. Because like, look, like, look at the decoy you, right there. You you aim you for got the a exit. huge area. Yeah, you know, yeah. And it's, but when you when all of a sudden you're way up there in a tree stand, yeah, instead of yep. shooting this, you're shooting. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And I have a tendency to hit too high out of a tree mm -hmm. stand. Mm -hmm. Like what I did in in Minnesota, I did that a lot as a kid in a tree stand. Yeah, we've talked up. about this. You need to start aiming like that far from the belly. I know. Well, <laughs> and, and I've been drilling that into my brain for years yeah. and i'm, I'm well, not the getting belly better up here yeah yeah up, up yeah forward and low yeah. like aim yeah. forward and low it's just how i've kind of i guess reset mm -hmm. my brain on that you know, i thought. think a lot of people get into that i mean you look at it and deer there and you you push it right through there where that little mm -hmm. what is that that top piece of tape yep like center mass and you're like perfect shot yeah and, and and people get that ingrained in them and they're like perfect shot shoot it's shoot, hard shoot. to hit a deer low and not get him 
especially on the ground. Yeah. Uh, in a tree stand, it's different, but on the ground, it's hard to nick one low. Right. I mean, you can be like that far above the line and still kill them, you know, from the, the, the bottom. I mean, right. Right. assuming that the deer is not just, you know, an absolute tank and got all this extra brisket, muscle and meat, fat, whatever, but I mean, it's hard to miss mm-hmm. a deer low. But. Shane probably remembers that one. He helped me track that it was so low that the broad had, I think we saw a nick on the sternum. Oh, wow. really? Yeah, we were trying to figure out how it killed it because it <laughs> went right through that like cartilage stuff on the very bottom of the bridge. It was so low, but the deer was There's an blood artery. Blood. I it's found out later. Yeah. There's an artery that runs right on the top of that that you must have sliced. That's crazy, man. And, uh, that deer yeah. didn't go, what, 75, 100, 100, 110 yards, I think it was. Yeah, it didn't go super far. Huh? It didn't go super no. far. No. And what's funny about that real quick, um, we Callie took me to this clump of trees and there was blood right there and I was like, This deer bedded here or or stood here for a moment and Callie had me going around the tree and she couldn't figure it out. I said, it Must be a scent pool here where it bedded or something. We went around the tree and I said, Garrett, go around the tree and see if you can find a blood trail leaving this area. And he walks around the backside. He says, Shane, the deer's laying right here. Yeah. We walked li- literally like 10 feet or yeah. less from it. And I was so zeroed in <laughs> on the ground. And we were just doing circles right there. And even she didn't see it. She yeah. was so, like, I smell it right here Ultra somewhere. Ultra focused mm-hmm. on yeah. but it. was uh, thick, early season, lots mm-hmm. of foliage. Like, Oh, yeah. And then the flies, it was 93 degrees that morning or for the high that day. And it was already getting close to that. And he went to get the truck, and when he got back, we, we'd we asked the, the guy on the private land, could we use his driveway to come down there and get it? Mm-hmm. I said, come look at your deer. The flies had already laid masses of eggs on the hide wow. in the hair. It was yeah. yeah, it was covered in it. I'm like, they don't waste no time. <laughs> this deer is still fresh, and they're laying eggs yeah, on the You're not worried about the coyotes. Yeah, they're like, yeah. winter's yeah. on its way. We got we to gotta <laughs> procreate. Yeah, that's wild. So, Garrett, I know you're quite the tinker when it comes to arrows and bows and everything, but what would you say has been the biggest key things that you've learned and, and kind of your go-to if you had to, like, pick one thing that you're going to use for forever? As far yeah. as setups, like, yeah. to kind of follow up with so these, yeah. I think for me it's just kind of balancing the trade-offs, taking the wins where you can get them, but realizing what limitations I might be leaving on the table as well. So... For a long time growing up, I just used kind of what you'd call an average setup mm-hmm. and just focused on, you know, shooting mechanics. And then after learning about the Ashby studies, like a lot of guys basically went full Ashby and tried that yep. for a little bit yep. and then started backing off of certain things. Like, well, maybe I keep the same arrow weight, try, you know, a two bladed bleeders instead of a single bevel, mm-hmm. or maybe try, you know, mid 500 to grain arrow. Um, and eventually just kind of started slowly working my way back down in, in arrow weight, but not giving up what I had learned about really structurally sound arrow, good component system, um, and perfect arrow flight. And now I'm kind of at the point where it's like, okay, if I get those couple of things as just a constant, like I'm never going to have a setup where I'm sacrificing arrow flight, Mm -hmm. forgiveness, Mm -hmm. um, or something that could break, then I've still had really good results with getting that arrow speed back up a little bit. And then on the broadhead forgiveness side of thing, it's like, well, there's there's obviously trade-offs no matter what way you go. So I have generally just started using two different types of broadheads in my quiver. And I'll just, like, if I'm on the ground and I'm only going to get a max 18 yard shot, I'm putting a, a, you know, broadhead like an iron wheel or something on the Mm -hmm. front of it. But then for just generally everything else, I might be running a mechanical Mm -hmm. and then I can use a little bit smaller vein. It's quieter. And then it just it's so much more forgiving. I mean, that's that part of it. I've always, you know, I take notes and true groups, windy days, calm days. And it's like, okay, well this combination for me gives me the best accuracy forgiveness. I can't control what the deer does necessarily, but that's a big part of it. And if the arrow is quieter and, and all these things, then if I do end up in a scenario where that arrow is knocked and I get that quartering two shot scenario out of a tree, it's like, Oh, I won't take that shot. Yeah. But then if I'm on the ground, I'm probably not going to have that arrow knocked anyway, and I have some more flexibility. Mm-hmm. Nothing changed with the speed, the the arrow weight, the components, or anything. I'm just changing what's on the front, and yeah. I know how each of those flies, and I know how mm-hmm. well my bow is tuned. Yeah. I think that's one of the best answers I've ever heard, your, your ability to weigh the pros and the cons. And I think mm-hmm. that one frustration that I have is, we talk a lot with ranch fairy and we talk a lot about heavier arrows and cut on contact broadheads. And the feedback sometimes is, well, you know, 
you guys think this and it's wrong for all these reasons. Like, I don't actually even disagree with that. Yeah, there's some cons to using a heavier, mm-hmm. a heavier arrow setup. And I think that one thing that I completely agree with is that the arrow flight, if you have good flight that, consistently, that seems to yeah, really be a big factor. That is, that is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's, things are so much more interchangeable than when it's flying true. Yeah. You know, you could be switching broadheads and what have you, but you're not worried about it planing or coming out fish tailing. Yeah. You know, it's like you're, you're actually. And I've had the same issues that it sounds like you've been having the last few years as well, mm-hmm. where before I had been using just a long list of, of bows and arrow setups that were working for me, mm-hmm. flying, I mean, pretty minimal thought into making them fly well. But then all of a sudden I was using stuff that just was not meshing for whatever reason it was not consistent now i could get it to where it would paper tune and it would be great but then you put it out into the the variables and it was doing some weird stuff which stressed me out like i'd catch a little wind or something and it would completely throw things off and then i switched again this year to a different arrow um different broadhead and i feel like now i'm getting this consistent flight that i haven't had in years and weight aside i don't really care about that at the end of the day if i can get the thing to fly well and consistent and i think Mm. that yeah you have to be realistic with those trade-offs as well because i mean if you want to shoot longer if you are put in those situations i always would use like an example of if you live in the plains and your odds of shooting over 40 yards are significantly higher yeah. than the person that's right. living in the right. you know northern Minnesota, for example. But your odds of encountering crosswinds of 40 miles per hour right. are too. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, it's like... But Aeroflight, I yeah. totally agree with that. And, and and I don't know how excited you are now that you've got your setup uh, flying true again. You were worried about the little... But I had Garrett you know, help me with my recurve. I've been shooting it great. I've killed a deer with it. I killed a turkey with it. Mm-hmm. But it kept kicking up, and I couldn't figure out why. And, and mentally, that was bothering me, even mm-hmm. though I was consistently hitting. Oh, yeah. My groups the, were always fine, yeah. too. Well, it's my like, groups weren't super. They were yeah. acceptable, Yeah, you know, and out to 15 yards or 20 yards. And I asked Garrett. He'd give me some help and get the you know slow-motion camera. And it didn't take him long on me shooting my bow. And I actually went to an archery shop, and they didn't have the solution. He's like... I think your arrow knock is sliding down the string. He put a little thing on the first shot through the paper, perfect bullet hole, shot it again. We videoed it. And I went home, and I was just smoking that target. And uh, and I I even shot it at 30 yards and hit my target. And I'm like, I called him up. I said, man, I've never been so excited about shooting my recurve. I mean, I thought I was just having trouble learning, you know, the instinctive shoot. And it's going to take a lot more practice. And part of the reason was my arrow was kicking off the, mm-hmm. the, the Because shelf. of the knock point. Yeah, it would slide down the string as because I only had one knock here and I'd shoot three fingers under. Mm-hmm. And as I released, it would slide under and then it hit the shelf and kick up. Yeah. And I could notice a little kick up in, you know, in real time. And then I had <clears throat> my daughter video on my phone and could see it really kick up. And um, but that's one of the things that I guess I got off track, but having that perfectly tuned mm-hmm. arrow, the arrow flight, it not only shoots better, it gives you confidence. And, mm-hmm. and like I said earlier, it made me excited to get out there and start shooting oh, my recurve more because I was it, more consistent. It, it gets stressful when, you know, you're not on. And that's what switching to my broadheads and is like two years ago. I think I could have chased my sights like all the way down. Like oh, it was yeah. like no matter what. I'm like, am I dropping or what? Like it was <laughs> like I, it always was planing low, mm-hmm. like no matter what I did. And scratch um, your head all the time like what's going yeah, on yeah well, yeah and, and your attention to detail is what makes you have the performance that you want like you're never going to miss something and if you can't figure it out you're just going to do whatever you can to figure it out and i think that's something that i'm not as capable of doing i get frustrated and i can't focus on thinking at that through enough and having like so like hayden helped me get my arrow set up did the same thing that you're talking about with mm-hmm. the knock my knock uh, my D loop was set up for a different knock and it was just barely pinching to where oh, when it would come uh, off, it was doing that same thing. It'd come off and just kind of skip off the rest. And he set a new D loop for me. Next thing you know, I mean, I, 
I shot the best bullet hole. Like it was like not just a <laughs> bullet hole. It was like it was like you could see where the yeah. arrow like smashed the paper and the fletching just barely had those little. Yep. It was in the confidence when that's the case and you're shooting down range and everything's just boink. Poof, like man, mm-hmm. that's a good feeling. Mm-hmm. So, and I also think that ultimately helps your pass through rate as well. Yeah. So again, back to that like being frustrated with promoting you know certain setups it's like at the end of the day like shoot what you want use weigh the trade-offs and then get good arrow flight and you're yep. gonna have better yep. odds like start start there you know mm-hmm. yeah. and then that is the, yeah, the arrow flight is number that's one. that's yeah that's the base of it all mm-hmm. i mean <clears throat> going with the heavier setups and then i backed mine off um a couple of years ago to like 530 or so mm-hmm. just because i mean for for one you, you you gauge between 30 and 20 yards it's like it's starting to make a difference now you, mm-hmm. you know you get you get your um weight down it's like all right there's a little room little room for error you know you can miss you can misjudge a yardage and get away with more yeah. as your arrow weight yeah. goes down yeah and you don't really sacrifice and from what i had significant but the arrow flight difference mm-hmm. was significant yeah. you know I'm, I'm not quite ready to I like to buy heavier than what I used to uh, shoot arrow, you know, and I backed off. I used to be 660, 670 grains. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not I'm not ready to go back to 405. I, no. I still like my nice solid 550. Yeah. It it shoots straight, you know, 30, 40 yards. I don't, I, mean, I don't have huge pin gaps, and it's punching through the animals. Mm-hmm. I like it. And if, especially if I was going to go to a sever or something, I'd keep my current set up mm-hmm. and just put – if I could get a 200 grain sever on the front of it, you know, um, to, to expand the cutting dam- diameter. Yeah, just then that's basically it. And then not, I mean, the arrow flight I'm not so worried about, or the planing, whatever, the mm-hmm. wider fixed blade. But it would be nice to if if there was a mechanical. You know, I'm I'm one of those people that like you know I don't like moving parts. I like a solid object going that way so it can't mess up. But if I mean if it could be something made solid, I mean. Uh, robust and and then had moving parts something i could trust but then that low profile to get through that little hole you know if i wanted to shoot through there um i would be willing to try it. i'm still on the fence about it i'm not 100 percent convinced but uh you know i'm i'm only at the point where if somebody says if you had to suggest a, bra- a mechanical it would be a seven mm-hmm. i'm not to the point where i want to use one quite <laughs> yet <laughs> and the truth comes out yeah. <laughs> i mean nothing's nothing's wrong with what i'm shooting now i'm still yeah. finding my deer i'm getting yeah. past those the blood trails are yeah. uh, acceptable and sometimes they're even really good depending on how where i hit them mm-hmm. if i especially if i get them up front yeah so we talked about the the hunter aspect you know, how easy it is to basically submit a track. Mm-hmm. And then in the future, how we'll be able to look at the data. Mm-hmm. And, then the, and the benefits to the tracker. Benefits to the tracker, the current workflow, how it's such a hassle, how this solves that issue. Mm-hmm. The, the the biggest thing with describing this, when, when I knew we were going to sit down and start talking about it, there's so many different ways to attack it, to, to describe it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not as simple as saying, hey, create a hunter account and submit a tracking request and as a tracker receive it. Uh, yeah, it is that mm-hmm. simple, but there's so many aspects, like you say, benefits to trackers, benefits to hunters. There'll be uh, other aspects that'll be built in in a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, just download it and explore it. And if you have an iOS, um, you're just going to have to wait a little bit and you'll, you'll be able to download it. But I think um, I think people are really going to enjoy the uh, – what's coming with the app the way the app is right now the efficiency at, at getting trackers and hunters connected mm-hmm. um i think it's a win-win for all of us and like i've said from the beginning we're trying to do this in a way that it costs as little to both parties as possible you know mm-hmm. even free if we can make it that way and so we'll take advantage of the the data collection mm-hmm. to people that want to pay you know 399 a month whatever we decide to do you know, and then waive all the other fees to use the app for tracking mm-hmm. um, and cover because it's not cheap. You know, even oh, yeah. like just maintaining the app, the servers for Amazon and Google and for whatever sure. other service we use, the media uploads, that costs us money every yeah. month. Yep. And so it's not, even if it's just sitting out and we're not doing any improvements, we're spending money. Yep. So um, so keep that in mind when you start using this app and say, hey, the, the, they put a lot of time and effort into this yeah. to help make our lives easier. And I'm, you know, 
I have a, a I'm kind of invested in it because I'm a tracker. I want to see something like yeah. this come to light. Well, and I think what's cool about what you do specifically, like you're not asking people for money even. Tip is welcome, but it's not like you're out here doing this to make a profit. So when any fee pops up with this app, it's not like it's to make a profit. It's to help right. better the hunting community, help the connection yep. of hunters, trackers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just important to keep in mind if you're going to use this app. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's to cover the costs we've already incurred and spend money on improving it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then mm -hmm. as we get feedback, because we're going to hopefully get feedback from mm -hmm. hunters and trackers and saying, hey, be nice if I could do this be nice if I could do that. Oh, we didn't even think about that. And we, that's why we had the test group of trackers. We wanted to try and cover all the that's bases and things that we weren't thinking of. Like, ah, oh, there's like, that's been super helpful. Yeah. Uh, one of our test trackers, he came up with an idea and, and I was like, oh, why don't we think about it? And we submitted it. And then the, the following week we had it in there. And that was like the notifications. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you could swipe them away mm -hmm. and it was very touchy. And then once you swipe, there was something going on with that. And he said, can you make it where yeah. you do this? I'm yeah, like, you just had to, like, touch it, and it was, I'm like, that's you know. <laughs> a good idea. Yeah, we should do that. I mean, there's there's been other things, too. I mean, oh, absolutely. And so that we hope we'll get that feedback. Mm -hmm. And if we can take some of the little bit of revenue we make from it to, to add those mm -hmm. features and continue to make this app better. And one thing I want to stress is, I you know I we have a tracking group in Minnesota. There's other there's an Iowa blood trackers mm -hmm. group. There's one in South Carolina, and, and I'm in communication with some of those guys as we get trackers on board on this app. You know, add them to the app and vetted and, and um, approved rather. And I I hate to see those state groups go away because mm -hmm. there's like in our group there's a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. We work together, and it doesn't have to. And I'm hoping that as we go down the road that you know we we put on UBT tests. Most of the money we get, we donated ourselves, our trackers. We're, I'm throwing in $40. Other trackers are throwing in $100, you know, and we put on, uh, we have a booth at a show or something, or we put on a UBT event. And um, we're hoping if things go well that some of the revenue from this mm -hmm. app will go to the state groups mm -hmm. and they won't have to ask their trackers for it. Yep. You know, as their tracks come through here, they can get, them. You, know, you know, a percentage of it mm -hmm. and it'll help generate them revenue as, as well so yeah. it'll help everyone yeah and it, i think it's cool that it's important to you to keep the community of trackers mm -hmm. a thing and not stray away from that just because the app makes things more convenient still keeping those people in, in well, contact well, that we just learn from each other man yeah. like no doubt that just reminded me i mean one of the i mean you can still work together and still use the app but one of the um the features in here i didn't touch on is transferring a track Mm -hmm. So I had that happen last year. I was on a track, and I knew the deer was dead. And for whatever reason, that that night, Callie had advanced the track, but we got this one spot. And maybe the deer stood there and left a scent pool. She was struggling to break out of that spot. And then the hunter had tracked also, so he may have disrupted the scent trail. And I asked my buddy David, I said, do you have time to run this track behind me later tonight or tomorrow or whatever? And he's like, sure, I can come over tonight. And, and so – he came over there and he ran the track. His dog took the same path and then went beyond where Callie got hung up and they eventually found the deer. And in the app, we included that aspect where if you're on a track and a situation occurs, you can, you know, work with your trackers. You can call them up your, your, your community of trackers and say, Hey, I got this track. I want to transfer to you if you're available. Sure. You can, there's a process in here where you can send the, the offer to track to the hunter, the hunter, you know, you make aware of that this other hunter or tracker applies for it and then they request them. So then it converts all that data to that tracker mm -hmm. and it keeps tabs on all that. And so you can still do that in the app and work together as a group outside the app. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's pretty cool. So if somebody is wanting to find this here in the next couple of weeks, how exactly do they get do it? What's it called? What do you search? Where do you go? So it's called Tracker, T-R-A-K-R, mm -hmm. and it's available on Google Play and uh, the Apple App Store. Or if not available right now, it'll be available on the, on the App Store soon. Mm -hmm. But it will be available on Google Play right now when you're listening and watching this podcast. You can go to gettracker.com, mm -hmm. G-E-T-R, uh, two T's, G-E-T-T-R-A-K-R.com. And we'll have links where you can download it. And you can read all about the app. Mm -hmm. You can see the screens and ex explanation of mm -hmm. what features do what. Just like the manual in your car. And it points out to your dash cluster. 
um that's kind of the way it'll be and and then um yeah that's the the two spots you can go or three spots <laughs> cool well i think we'll also put some sort of link in the description of this podcast also to these guys youtube channels and i appreciate you guys taking the time to share it and also just appreciate the fact that this is going to be something that's available for hunters and trackers i think it's great and i'm excited to see how it helps everybody yeah, I'm I'm excited to see it in, uh, in play as well because it's yeah. something that's been we've worked on for quite a while. It's been in my head for a, a few head. years now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to see it become a reality. Yeah. It's something that's yeah. actually you know I can pick up my phone and actually use. And yeah, and it's finally there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. The launch days, you know, in a couple of days, so that's gonna be exciting. Well, thanks guys for taking the time and yeah, appreciate for it. it. Was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.